HK Cash in collaboration with and endorsed by the European Society of Cardiology, ESC. This summit is co-chaired by the president of HK Cash, Dr. Gary Shing Him Cheung, the chair of the ESC Working Group on Adults with Congenital Heart Disease, Professor Gerard Paul Diller from Münster, Germany and the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, as well as the past president of ESC, Dr. Professor Roberto Ferrari. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon uh, everybody, or perhaps I should say ni hao to everybody. I am um, Roberto Ferrari, I am Italian, but uh, at the moment I am uh, in a countryside in France and uh, it has been really a splendid uh, morning here. I'm uh, particularly happy to introduce this uh, joint section between the European Society of Cardiology and the Hong Kong Society of Congenital and Structural Heart Disease. And why I'm so happy to, to, do, to do this? Because uh, I believe a lot in uh, interconnecting, in uh, discussing clinical cases as you will do or learning about uh, new techniques as you will do across uh, uh, the world. And uh, I think that medicine is nice uh, just because uh, we can exchange uh, ideas, thought, problems uh, between colleagues. And uh, also for me is uh, it's, it's very nice to, to do that with uh, Chinese and uh, colleagues from uh, Hong Kong, because uh, when I was president, unfortunately, many, many years ago, I was the one who managed to affiliate the Chinese Society of Cardiology with the, the ESC. Now, um, the, the, your chairman already uh, said uh, what you will have, and I'm sure it will be a very interesting section. Uh, we do have two representatives of Europe, uh, Professor Diller and uh, Professor Henderson. I saw already some of the images of Professor Henderson, and they look extremely promising. I'm not an interventionist, and, uh, but uh, of course, in my department, there are a lot of interventionists and um, they are using a lot of uh, intracardiac uh, echocardiography and uh, my duty is uh, just to pay for all these catheters, uh, devices uh, and so on. So uh, I like very much Boston Scientific, but uh, I hope they will keep uh, calm and don't come with a lot of innovations because uh, for me, is a problem to pay for all of them. So said, the last thing which I would like to tell you is the possibility to, uh, to consider at least uh, the uh, publication of uh, this symposium. And uh, the European Air Journal has um, a dedicated uh, um, section which is called the European Air Journal Supplement, The Heart of the Matter. And I think you have some slides, perhaps we can show them. And um, it's, it is possible uh, to reproduce uh, all uh, your talk in a, a monothematic uh, way. The journal is distributed to all the members of the European Society of Cardiology, so more than 30,000. And um, it has uh, also a small impact factor of two. And uh, what is really good is uh, that uh, it is monothematic. So if somebody wants to learn um, about that, this particular topic, will uh, go to the journal. And, um, and the other thing is that I'm the editor. And uh, somehow I can reassure you a rather quick uh, uh, review system. So this is uh, just uh, as a consideration. 
And uh, what uh, I have to do now is to wish you a very, very good symposium. I will uh, uh, follow it and um, thank you very much for uh, really accepting this uh, joint section between the Hong Kong Society and the ESC. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, she -she. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Ferrari. So, um, any, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Gerald Dura to have an opening speech for us. Um, oh, I, um, I think uh, he is. Can you hear me? Not, I don't know. I, I had some, some interruption in the connection. Okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry for this. So thank you very much for including me. And uh, it's also a pleasure for me to be part of, the, uh, of this uh, great uh, symposium. I'm a structural inter and uh, congenital cardiologist in, in Germany, in Münster, and also at the Royal Brompton Hospital in, in London. And I'm um, obviously representing the uh, ACHD working group uh, on um, uh, of the ESC, so the Adults with Congenital Heart Disease Working Group. And as you know, this is a group of patients that is affected by many lifelong complications, including arrhythmias and structural problems. So, you know, a great deal of, of things to do in this, in this growing and evolving uh, population. So I think um, this is um, uh, an, exciting, an exciting area, not only for us um, in, in, at this part of the world, but obviously a global and increasingly global problem. So really um, uh, glad uh, to, to be part of this. And I'm really, I can only echo uh, what Professor Ferrari said, and I'm looking forward to a great, great meeting. Thank you for, for having me. In this feature presentation session, the renowned expert keynote speaker, Dr. Professor Asker Anderson of the Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark, shares his insights regarding European experiences and the feasibility of intracardiac echocardiography to guide implantation. Thank you very, very much. I'm extremely honored to get the invitation to give a talk about the, our experience and some of the European experience of intracardiac to guide it. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Uh, sorry, um, I think you're mute. I can see, we can see you, but uh, can't hear your voice, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you very clearly now. Excellent. Thank you. So just a brief uh, geography uh, here. Uh, I represent Aarhus University Hospital and we are referral center, tertiary center oh. of 1.3 million uh, oh, people. And Denmark is located yeah. in the northern part of Europe. I'm sorry, because I'm in France. And, um, I have some conflicts of interest I have to disclose. So intracardiac echocardiography, what is that? Intracardiac echocardiography is a, a small catheter with an echo probe at the tip of the catheter. There are several vendors of intracardiac echocardiography, but for most of them, you have two knobs where you can do an anterior posterior steer, or you can do a left and right steer. I'll just show you on this brief video. Here you can see the anterior steer and the posterior steer. And then on the other knob, you can do a right and a left steer. That's the left steer and there's the right steer. You can also do combination of both left and right for a bit more complicated um, uh, steering of the catheter. So do we prefer ice or do we prefer tea? 
T was used in all the randomized trials there is on LAO. It offers multiplanar and 3D imaging, so you can get several views of the appendage and of the device. ICE does not. There is some costs involved. TE is not very costly. Most, most uh, centers have it available. ICE is more costly for the catheter, but of course, in ICE, you don't need an echo operator. You don't need anesthesia. So costs between TE and ICE is really dependent on local availability and also reimbursement policies. TE, there's widespread experience. Every cardiologist can do a TOE. And in ICE, it's limited uh, experience. For TE as an operator, if you're not used to doing ICE, you can focus only on the intervention and you can have your colleague doing the imaging for you. For ICE, you need also to steer the ICE catheter and uh, thereby you cannot focus your entirely uh, uh, focus on the intervention. For TE, in most centers, in our center anyway, we would need general anesthesia. Some can do it in local uh, or deep sedation with propofol, but uh, that has limited availability as well. In local anesthesia, that can be done by, by ICE. You can do it completely in local without any sedation, and I think that, that may be difficult with TE. For ICE, you don't need a dedicated echo operator. You will need that for TE. So you can do ICE as a single operator procedure without any other physicians in the room. There's a risk of esophageal damage with TE. Of course, there's not this risk with ICE, but you will have other risks with ICE as cardiac preparation if you're not careful. For TE, you don't need a lot of pre-procedural planning. You can do it on the table. Um, of course, it's nice and it may shorten your procedure time. And uh, for ICE, you uh, don't need, uh, you do need some pre-procedural -pre planning. So our experience with ICE is that we are only two operators in our center that does uh, LAAO. We have done around a thousand uh, procedures in total and 800 of these procedures are guided by ICE. What we like about using ICE is actually also the pre-procedural CT. It really allows for a careful planning of the procedure. So you really appreciate the anatomy before you start your procedure and that shortens procedure time and just makes it a, a, a very predictable what you do all the way through the procedure. As mentioned, this is a single operator procedure. There's no anesthesia or extra echo operator. And this is actually me here in the cat lab. And this is the scrub, scrubbing nurse you have here. And over, over here, you have the floor nurse, Gide, who is also operating the console for the ice uh, uh, probe. So we can really do it as a single operator in local anesthesia. And this really improves the cath lab flow. It makes a very minimalistic approach. So the patient can basically walk into the table, lay up, we can do the procedure and they can uh, get out of the room uh, immediately and we can get the next patient. And this gives a very high level of patient satisfaction. And in most patients, we can do same day discharge. They come in and then discharge the same day. The flow we have for the procedures is that we start with the pre-procedural CT scanning. Here we can assess the anatomy. We can assess whether or not there is an LAA thrombus. We can do the sizing of the device and we can uh, plan on the device position. We can assess the angio projections. What are the best projections for the implants? And we can do overall planning. Then we do the procedure guided from ICE from the LA. We do the transeptal guidance guided by ICE. We have anatomical markers here, the mitral valve and the CX. We have optimal landing of the device and we can show ceiling and we have several views we can use that I will come back to later. For follow-up after uh, LAO, we only do CT now. And for CT, we can see the device position. Here you have the device on top here. We can west, uh, uh, assess whether or not there are DRT, device-related thrombus, and we can also look for peri-device leads. Just briefly on pre-procedural CT scanning. We use uh, a software, we have multi-planar view. We start by looking at the 3D images to appreciate the anatomy 
uh, where the takeoff of the LA is and uh, just get a, a, a 3D sense of how the anatomy is and how to approach the procedure. Then we use the multiplanar views. If you look at the top right here, you have the appendage and we can put in, depending on what type of device we're using, the landing zone. And then we uh, can look at the lower left corner and here this the landing zone for this device and we can measure it and choose device size based on the landing zone. For the procedure, we use two uh, punctures in the groin. We always do ultrasound guided punctures and we have one lateral, it's this one on the left and we have a medial. The lateral one is used for uh, yeah, the transeptal puncture uh, and of course also the uh, delivery catheter of the device and the medial puncture is used for the ice probe. Then after the procedure, when we are done, we do a figure of H suture that we close with the stopcock so this is instead of tying a nut, we can just tighten a stopcock over the suture. And this is really appreciated by our ward nurses because if there's not hemostasis after the procedure or two, time, two hours after the procedure when they loosen the suture, they can retighten the suture and they don't need to, to spend time uh, uh, doing compression in the groin if there's a bleed. With the ice catheter, when you advance it to the left atrium, you get to the home view. The home view is where you have the aortic valve and you have the tricuspid valve and then you have the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary valve down here. Then what we do is that we rotate the catheter and then we get to the interatrial septum where you have the fossa uh, ovalis here. And uh, if you do a slight uh, counterclock movement, you will get to the anterior part of the septum and with a, a, a clockwise movement, you get to the posterior part of the septum. And I'll just show you here how we do with the probe. We just rotate it slightly clockwise from the home view, and then we do a slight posterior tilt here on the AP knob to get into the septal view. Then we can see uh, the needle here tenting on the interatrial septum. This is also something we do with pre-procedural CT. We always plan where we want to puncture to get the best access to the LA. And here it's a fairly mid septal puncture we need to get access. After we've made the, the puncture, we cross with the wire to the left upper pulmonary vein. But then we use the delivery catheter of the, for, the, for the device to dilate the hole in the interatrial septum. So this is what you see here. We take it up, dilate the hole, and then we basically take the catheter back down to the inferior vena cava. Then we have a slightly larger hole in the interatrial septum than just with the transeptal puncture, and we have a wire. And then we can follow the wire with our ice probe into the left atrium, because we do all our eyes from the left atrium for left atrial appendage closure. Then in the left atrium, we have three standard projections we use to guide the implantations and also to assess the results after implantation. We have the mid atrial view. Here the eyes probe is located in mid atrial. We have the left upper pulmonary vein view, where the ice probe is located in the left upper pulmonary vein. And then we have the supramitral view, and this is uh, looking up towards the device, and the, the probe is located between the left atrial appendage and the mitral valve. And here you see the corresponding uh, ice images. You see the mid atrial view, where you have the circumflex here and the mitral valve. Here you have the left upper pulmonary vein view. You can see the left upper pulmonary vein here, and the ice probe is located in the top of the left upper pulmonary vein. And down here you have the supramitral view. So here everything is turned upside down. Here you have the circumflex down here and the mitral valve down here. You can also see the pulmonary artery down here, and, and you can see also the ridge between the left upper pulmonary vein. I will just uh, briefly go through uh, the different projections again. So when we are in the left upper pulmonary vein, this is what we have here. This is also where we have the wire and we advance our delivery catheter to. 
And down here, you nicely see the left atrial appendage and the circumflex and the mitral valve. And here you just see the, the position of the catheter and uh, the ice probe on the floor screen. Then, after uh, having in left pulmonary uh, vein, we take the sheath a little back and then we advance the pigtail catheter to the, to the left appendage. And over the pigtail catheter, we put our delivery sheath. After we have the delivery sheath, we do an angio. And that's because even though we've done the pre-procedural planning, it's always nice to have a dynamic image of the left atrial appendix. You must remember that the CT scan is, of course, only a flash of the cardiac cycle. We try to time it to have it in the atrial diastole. But to make 100% sure about our mission and our, and our understanding of the anatomy, we do an angio to make sure that we, our measurements we did on CT was correct. Then we put in the device. You can see here on the left screen, you have the ball position. This is a Watchman Flex device. And you see we uh, put out the device and you have the corresponding fluoro image on the right screen here. Then when we uh, put the device in, for the flex device, we do a tuck test. That's what you see here. You have the cable for the device here. And you just do a very gentle uh, tuck on the device just to make sure that everything is good. And what you can really appreciate here with the eyes image, you can actually see it really sticks to the left atrial appendage wall. You can actually see we're kind of pulling the appendage up when we do the pull test. So this device is really, uh, situated very, very good in the left atrial appendage. And this is the corresponding fluoro images on the right screen. Okay, I'll just switch to another procedure and another device. And this is to um, show you how we get from the left upper pulmonary vein view to the supramitral view. So what we do is we wrote Pull the probe, rotate it 180 degrees, do a posterior flex, and then push it a little forward. I'll just show that again. Pull it 180 degree, posterior flex, and push it forward. And bottom right, I can just show you movements on the ice catheter. 180 degree turn, posterior flex and then just slightly push the probe forward. And I'll just show it again here on the, on the um, fluoro pull, 180 degree posterior flex and push it forward. And here you can see the corresponding image top right of the, of the, the, the device situated here. Here it's an amulet device. You can see the circumflex here. You can see the appendix down here. And then at the end of the procedure, we'll do an angiogram to make sure that it's situated nicely. And then we'll release the device like this to make sure that everything is uh, well situated in the left image. And this is the final ice image of that procedure. So it's very nice that we have a procedure that we can do and we get nice images. But is it any good? Is it better than TOE? And I'll just show you some data. We have retrospective data from three different studies. This is the TEE data from the amulet observational study. This is TEE data from a study we did with 100 cases of TEE and then the corresponding 100 cases of ice here. And this is the most recent publication of the retrospective data. This was the first flex cases we did the first 91 Watchman Flex cases we did in almost all guided by ice. What you see is the technical success. That I have just one more point. There's also some time here. This was the early phase. This was around 2017. And here you have the recent data from around 2020. 
So technical success is good all through the different type of modality and time period. Contrast use is getting less and less used. And if you look at uh, the data we have from TE versus ICE, you see we use a little less contrast with, uh, with ICE. Fluoro time is around 15 minutes from the amulet observational study and also our study from 2017. And for the recent series for the flex device, we used only 11 minutes. The big point here is the cath lab time. We only have data on this from our own lab and we can see that cath lab time, this is total time spent in the cath lab for the patient was 116 minutes with TE and 87 minutes for ice. And this is half an hour extra for each patient in the cath lab due to anesthesia. The procedure time was very short in the amulet observational study, 33 minutes. It was a little longer at our center. And then with our eyes, 44 minutes and the recent series, 38 minutes. In patients that are anesthetized, it's not only time in the cath lab, there's also a time in the post anesthetic care, and that's what was 90 minutes, 91 minutes. Days of admission was 2.5 days for the TEE group in the amulet observational study, two days in our early cohort and only one day in our latest cohort. Major complication, very important point in LAA closure to reduce complication. It was 10% in the TEE amulet observational study, 5.7% uh, uh, in uh, our TEE cohort, early TEE cohort, 2% in our first ICE cases and around 5% for the flex species. So this is very good. This is all retrospective data, but in, it's uh, of course very important to have some prospective data. And I'm actually very happy to uh, be able to present the next slide. This was very kindly uh, borrowed to me by my proctor and a good colleague, uh, Jens Erik Nielsen Kusk, um, who uh, was the PI of this ICE LAA clinical study. So this is, was a prospective multi-center clinical study around seven European LAA centers. A hundred patients were included with a primary endpoint of sealing at 45 days and uh, evaluated by TEE. And then there was a safety endpoint all uh, images were analyzed by an independent echo prolab. This was done with the Watchman Flex device, and here you can see images from our ICE procedures, the lift of pulmonary venues, supramitral view, and here also we can assess with color whether or not there are any leaks. The primary endpoint was significant peridivice leaks, more than five millimeter at 45 days. And there were zero. 0, 0.0, so no significant leaks at uh, uh, 45 days in 100 patients. If we look at post-procedure leaks, these are evaluated by ICE. There was no leaks in 98.5, and then uh, 1.5 patients had leaks from three to five millimeters. So, and if we look at 45 days, there was no leaks in 75%. And in 22, there were, were these very small leaks from zero to three millimeters, small proportion with those moderate leaks of two to, to five. And as the primary endpoint said, there were no uh, significant period device leaks defined as leaks above five millimeter. Safety endpoints were mortality. There was one death but it was unrelated to the procedure. There were no strokes, no systemic embolisms. There were three major bleeds uh, and two uh, non-procedural major bleedings. There were no pericardial effusions, no device embolization, and no device-related thrombus. So my personal opinion is that I will pass on the T because I like ice, and thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Nelson, for your excellent talk in the review of Ice Guide LAO. So, I also congratulated to your center in the good result of Ice Guide LAO in your center. So, uh, maybe let me um, to, uh, start the discussion by asking you the questions first. 
Um, uh, according to the Watchman or Watchman Fest uh, criteria for device um, uh, fully de uh, final deployment, we need to assess uh, the device compression. Uh, if from the TE, we need to measure the compression in four different angles, zero degree, 45 degree, 90 and 135 degrees. It should reach uh, uh, 10 to 30 percent of device compression before we can uh, securely and comfortably release the device finally. But in ice guard procedure, the ice at this uh, age, we can we still cannot have a 3D ice uh, commentary. So how can you uh, compare these two methods in order to have a more secure, a comfortable um, for for our operator to f f uh, release the device uh, with the chance of over or under compression? I think that's a really excellent uh, question. I didn't show it in my slides, but uh, what we do is we use those three ice views we had. We use the left upper pulmonary vein view, we use the mid atrial view, and we use the supramitral views. And in all of these views, all three views, we do a uh, measurement of compression. And if we get a compression between 10 to 30%, with the Watchman Flex in those position, uh, uh, positions, we are confident to release. And we've done, uh, yeah, we, we've done a lot of flex procedures and it's, uh, it seems uh, doable with ice and we haven't had any device embolizations. So um, um, I'll, my next question would be, that uh, I, I noticed that you will have a CT for all the aerial procedure. So uh, how about your experience that, uh, what's your final uh, decision of the, the size device? Is it usually have a significant difference between the, your uh, initial decision based on the CT measurement and the final outcome uh, in, the, in the device uh, size usage? So uh, can you share your experience with us? Yes, so CT is really good, I think. It really gives you a nice understanding of the anatomy. And it also uh, gives you a very nice appreciation of the size and the shape of the appendage to choose your landing zone and also the size of the device. One uh, caveat of CT is, of course, that it's only a flash of the cardiac cycle. So in some cases, you can have the appendage in a very contractile state, especially if the patient is in sinus rhythm. And that's why it's so important to do the angio. So if we have a very small appendage on the CT and then on the angiogram, we see a larger appendage, we tend to trust the, uh, the angio for these cases. But I would say in, in most cases, uh, the CT measurements are correct. And also with the angiogram, you all know that as very skilled interventional cardiologists, they can be a di bit difficult to measure the size on angio because there's so much uh, overlay. So uh, for those borderline cases where we are in doubt whether or not to choose one or the other side, size, we also do some extra sizing with the ice. So we do the same three views and then we measure the landing zone with ice. But that's very rare. I think maybe one in 40 or 50 cases we do that. May I per perhaps ask you, did you do any ice guided intervention in patients with structurally abnormal hearts? Uh, you know, besides sort of the normal anatomy that you would expect? And is that feasible? Yes, it is. I don't personally have a lot of experience with it. So we do, we do ice guidance for tricuspid interventions. We do it for PFO closure. We do it for LAO. And then we also do it in those borderline cases where we are in doubt the patient have a, a prosthetic valve uh, endocarditis. Um, we did just last week a situs inversus case with ice, and that was feasible, but that's of course not a, a complex anomaly, it's just a, a switched heart. And um, since 2000, and I think it was 18, uh, we didn't do any congenital more at our center, so I don't have a lot of experience with ice in congenital. 
but I think it's feasible, but I think it's very important with ice that you really need to use it a lot. It takes, it's not difficult, but it's like learning T. You need to do a lot of cases before you get comfortable with it. And especially if you are doing complex and anomalous uh, anatomy. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Anderson, for the great talk. Uh, so I just have uh, two questions. So one is, uh, in your great experience, do you encounter any patient who is not suitable to use the ICE-guided LAA? So that means uh, anyhow you cannot use the ICE. Because, for example, in TE, if the patient has esophageal problems, so we cannot do the TE, right? So in your experience, any patient who is not suitable for the ICE-guided LAO, and the second question is, when you do ice LAO, so the, did you still measure the LA pressure in this matter, or is it, it does not matter at all? So for the first question, uh, the general answer is no. We don't have any patients we can do um, ice in. And of course, there are... Uh, Always, if you say no, there are some rare cases where it's not feasible. And we have just next week, we have a case with a patient that have a chronic thrombi in the right atrium and a PFO. So I'm not comfortable with the ice probe moving it around. So we'll do a Sentinel device and then we'll do TOE for that patient. But I think that's the first in yeah 800 patients that we need to do this. So um, that's the, the answer to the first question. And the second question is the pressure in the left atrium. So we do measure pressure in the left atrium for some cases, but we don't do it routinely. What our approach is, is that, is that we give them uh, 500 ml of saline uh, just before the procedure. So the, the, the LA is, uh, is yeah, well filled with fluids. And uh, you also get an impression of it when you uh, get your um, uh, transepsal catheter in and you want to flush it. We just open the three-way stopcock and see if there comes blood out. If there's not coming blood out, we, we close it again and we give some more saline. The first expert speaker is Dr. Tao of the Xi Jing Hospital in China, who shares details specific to the real-world clinical outcomes of LAAO in China. All right. So uh, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation, and uh, it's my great honor to have this opportunity to present our result here. And so uh, today uh, I will present a one-year uh, result of the record study. Uh, we will show clinical outcomes and anti-thrombotic therapy in patients with uh, LAO. Uh, record uh, uh, one is an investigator-initiated study and we have nothing to disclose. And so we, we all know that uh, uh, there are increased numbers of LAO procedures both in China and in uh, international uh, countries. And currently uh, in uh, non-valvular uh, ultrafibrillation, uh, LAO was non-inferior to uh, NORWARC in terms of primary endpoint. And also uh, uh, with a long-term follow-up of uh, Protect AF and the previous study, we can see that it has greatly decreased the expected uh, uh, thromboembolic uh, events um, uh, compared with uh, uh, this uh, after the procedure. And so with this uh, NCDR study, we can also see that over uh, the data are uh, over 38,000 uh, patients, and it has a uh, very high implantation success, 97.3%, uh, and with low uh, major complications. And uh, in this evolution study uh, with, with uh, very high risk patients, uh, uh, more than 70% of patients with uh, oral anticoagulation uh, contradiction, and we can see that it's decreased 79% uh, uh, lower than expected ischemic events and 40% lower than expected bleeding events. So now uh, it's the LAO uh, should uh, uh, very uh, good uh, efficacy and safety. But in East Asian uh, pa uh, patients, 
there is a paradox there. And com uh, compared with a Western country, uh, we have uh, a decreased benefit of antithrombotic therapy, uh, increased risk of bleeding, and a decreased adherence of anticoagulation uh, therapy. And beside, uh, we in previous Protect F and uh, evolution studies, there's no uh, East Asian uh, population included. And uh, uh, so we uh, decided to document the clinical performance of watchmen in Chinese uh, arterial patients. And in this study, we include 20 provinces, uh, 39 uh, uh, centers, and 159 operators. Uh, so uh, in China from uh, April 1st, uh, 2019 uh, to October 31st, 2020. And we screened uh, totally uh, 3,569 patients. And we exclude, um, uh, this is consecutive uh, patients. And we exclude the patients refused to uh, participate. And uh, also some uh, patients participate in other studies and some patients that cannot uh, to follow up due to COVID-19. So totally we enrolled 3,096 patients. And among these patients, the 14 patients that failed to um, implant the device. So we have totally 99.5% uh, of success rate. And we have 8.7% uh, complete 30 days follow up and 97. Uh, eight patients complete one year follow-up. So today I am uh, report one year events uh, analyzed uh, uh, among these uh, patients. So from these baseline uh, characteristics, we can see that we have 29.5% uh, of patients uh, more than uh, 75 years old, 23.2 a patient with diabetes, 45.8 patients with previous stroke or TIA, 10.6% uh, uh, patients with previous PCI and 10.2% patients with bleeding history. And uh, the average of uh, uh, ch uh, vascular score is four and 2.4 uh, average uh, high spread score uh, was uh, 2.4. So all these are uh, the uh, has uh, uh, increased uh, death and stroke uh, systemic events. Uh, we, 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 uh, these um, uh, the, the uh, age and diabetes and also this uh, previous uh, history have increased uh, uh, events. And for this procedure uh, characteristics, we can see that uh, the Chinese uh, patients more than 80% with a bigger uh, device and uh, uh, based on site report, 89.9% patients with complete sealing. And we have 58.4% uh, with general anesthesia. And uh, uh, with uh, 84 patients with um, image guided by uh, TE or eyes. And interesting that we have 42% uh, uh, of patients with combined procedure with uh, radio frequency abla ablation or cryoablation. And here is the uh, uh, clinical outcome. Uh, we can see that we have totally events rate of 5.49%. And in, uh, among these uh, 4.05 patients with death stroke and systemic embolism, and we have 2.08% of patients uh, with death and 226 with stroke. And among uh, these patients, 0.73% uh, uh, of patients with hemorrhage stroke. And we have 0.13% uh, uh, um, patients with systemic embolism and 2.48 patients with DR, uh, DRT and 2.26% uh, uh, patient, uh, of patients with uh, uh, life uh, straightening and a major bleeding, which include periprocedural bleeding. And from this result, we can see uh, compared with expected uh, uh, events, uh, we have uh, um, uh, almost 70% of patients with reduced uh, ischemic events. 
and uh, uh, compare uh, with uh, expected, we, we have 70, uh, 76.9 uh, patients uh, with um, reduced major bleeding, uh, which excluded procedural bleeding. And uh, compared with uh, a previous study, uh, we can see that uh, the death rate of record one study uh, was 2.1%. Uh, which uh, uh, is uh, comparable with other, uh, um, even lower with other uh, studies. But the hemorrhage stroke uh, com uh, a little bit higher in a number huh, compared with uh, other uh, studies. And we uh, analyzed the, um, the uh, configurations, uh, the impact of these con configurations. And for anesthesia, we can see that the local anesthesia compared with the general anesthesia, we didn't see any uh, difference compared with events rate. Uh, for image guiding, uh, we can see that um, you know, we, we also didn't see any uh, 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 difference uh, compared with uh, uh, Im uh, image guided or uh, uh, fluoroscopy guided only. Uh, there's no uh, statistical uh, uh, difference. But uh, with um, ablation, this combined procedure showed that uh, uh, decreased uh, ischemic events. And so uh, for these days, a stroke systemic uh, embolism, we can see that with ablation, and we have 3.2% uh, of ischemic events, and without uh, ablation, like 4.7%. And for this uh, residue uh, leak, uh, uh, we can see uh, that, uh, so for this crude, re crude result, uh, we, uh, we see the difference. Uh, so we can see that it has uh, decreased uh, events uh, in this complete ceiling uh, uh, group. But after we adjusted, uh, we has, um, uh, see, uh, now didn't see a uh, uh, significant difference. And for this experience, uh, we can clearly see that the, the centers with uh, LAC procedure less than 40 uh, cases a year have increased uh, bleeding risk, um, but uh, no difference uh, com uh, with uh, ischemic uh, events. So especially uh, with uh, periprocedural bleeding events that increased in uh, less experienced centers. And for this, uh, uh, the, the medication after the procedure, uh, we can see that it diverse, very diverse in Chinese uh, patients. And the, uh, this uh, yellow uh, uh, is uh, recommended by the ESC uh, guideline. And we can see that uh, we, in China, we have very low uh, percentage uh, according, uh, according to this guideline. Uh, we have uh, uh, more patients with uh, uh, 45 days uh, OAC and followed by uh, six months OAC and then with uh, anti-platelet therapy. And we have also 20% uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 patients with 45 uh, OAC and uh, followed by six months DAPT and then uh, prolonged uh, single anti-platelet. So these two group uh, have uh, uh, almost 50% uh, of patients. And if we, we look at these uh, medication reg uh, regimens, we can see that we have a very high uh, anti-coagulation uh, um, uh, percentage. And uh, like, um, so with the uh, warfarin and Norwalk, uh, 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 it's more than 90% with anti-coagulation uh, therapy. But at one year, we still have some patients with anticoagulation therapy, but the most patients uh, transfer to uh, DAPT or SAPT. If we compare with uh, medication, uh, we can see that uh, these, um, uh, the oral uh, antiplatelet therapy combined with uh, antiplatelet therapy, uh, this uh, strategy have a 5.3% uh, of events rate. And the prolonged OAC with 4.4% of uh, event rate. And this uh, prolonged DAPT with 3.7%. Uh, 
And uh, these uh, 45 days OAC uh, followed by six months DAPT and then prolonged SAPT with 2.5% of events rate. Although we cannot, uh, currently we, we cannot compare with uh, the, uh, just to show the numbers, but we need to do a more analysis for this result. So the conclusion is LAO with Watchman 2.5 is relatively safe and associated with a low risk of ischemic and bleeding outcomes. While the type of anesthesia and the image guidance had a non-significant impact on adverse events, we found that a combined procedure with ablation might be associated with lower risk of ischemic events. Uh, uh, while more than half of LAO patients were discharged with aspirin plus warfarin or Norwalk in US, and most patients received DAPT in Europe, but in the record study, we observed medication treatments have, had also derived from the standard protocols. 78.9% uh, uh, of Chinese patients had Norwalk moral therapy in the initial 45 days. Whether these different approaches to anti-thrombotic treatment are associated with differences uh, in outcomes is still unclear. And so we, we also, uh, just uh, uh, one slide, uh, I want you to uh, introduce our record two uh, RCT uh, study. And we uh, include PCI uh, plus uh, uh, with uh, 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 atrial fibrillation patients. And uh, when, uh, uh, in uh, LAO arm, another with uh, a Norwalk arm. So uh, uh, in these uh, uh, studies, uh, we will uh, com uh, uh, compare uh, this uh, uh, device-based uh, therapy compared with uh, medication device therapy uh, in this uh, special uh, group of patients. Uh, so uh, this is a, a clodment with, uh, with 39 uh, hospitals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor To. Uh, congratulations for your huge success in your study. And uh, also congratulate uh, your uh, high response, I mean the follow-up rate in your study. I think it's uh, quite high in your one-year study, the, the follow-up rate. Uh, I have several questions. So, so you show that the the patient uh, who, in Chinese patient in your study, so the patient will have more hemorrhagic stroke than is, uh, ischemic stroke. So do you think there is any reason uh, that can explain the difference? And uh, also, um, although this is a prospective study, so uh, you show that if a combined procedure with uh, ablation, the radio frequency ablation with the LAO, the outcome will be different okay, with uh, doing LAO alone, right? So in future, will you recommend to do both procedure together or just do LAO alone? Um, I think it's a very uh, important question. So before we do this uh, study, we didn't know this actually, but uh, uh, after this uh, study, we, we know that uh, they has a very high uh, uh, when uh, one stop procedure in China now is for, uh, 42%, which is higher than the other studies reported in, in the uh, other countries. Uh, so, but uh, com uh, with uh, our uh, results, we can see that it uh, reduced ischemic events. And uh, uh, even uh, after uh, the justification, uh, it's still P uh, almost 0.05. And if, if we uh, follow up for longer, we definitely will see the uh, difference. Uh, even in ad after adjust uh, um, result, we can see the difference. So we're pretty sure that uh, with a one-stop uh, one, one procedure didn't increase the adverse events, uh, even the peri-procedural events, but it has um, uh, some beneficial events. So, so in China, I, I feel that uh, uh, this increased uh, one-stop procedure maybe because the most of the doctors in China doing LAO procedure are EP physicians. That's why they do uh, two procedures together. But we, we're glad to see that it has a beneficial event to do one-stop. 
And another uh, question is about the ischemic events uh, and uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, events. So it's uh, interesting that uh, in China, we seldom use uh, uh, the uh, antiplatelet plus uh, anticoagulation after the procedure. Most of patients with only Norwalk uh, therapy compared with uh, the uh, other country, uh, the, the, at least they, at the initial 45 days, they pretend they prefer to use uh, a single antiplatelet therapy plus uh, their anticoagulation. But even with decreased uh, uh, entire thrombotic uh, intense, intense, uh, intense, but we still see the increased hemorrhage events. So that means in China, if especially in East Asia, we, we must uh, uh, to, to uh, how to say you, it's a very, uh, uh, the increased trait of uh, uh, hemorrhage, uh, 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 this phenomenon is to uh, uh, affect the Chinese people. Uh, so that's why we, we uh, reduce the, uh, 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 in uh, this, uh, no, even in uh, Novak therapy, we reduce the dose. We start to reduce the dose in Chinese population. And now we start to use a 10 milligram uh, of uh, uh, levosabin compared with other countries with 15 or 20. So this is a trade in China. I see. Thank, thank you so much, Professor. I totally agree with you. Even I, I think in my practice, I, I, I will drop the NORAC. I just start the anti pilot agent okay, without adding the NORAC. I hope to decrease the chance of breathing. So any other question from, from the other panelists? Hi, uh, hi, Professor. This is a, uh, it's a very nice talk that you had, but uh, I, I was just wondering concerning different um, guidance, including fluoroscopic uh, T and also uh, ICE guidance. I'm very interested in the uh, protocol in China, how you can just do it all throughout fluoroscopic guidance without too much of a clinical difference uh, between you know, I, uh, other imaging guidance. I mean, what is the protocol pre-sizing uh, during the procedure and post post procedure assessment. How do you actually um, carry that out in a just fluoroscopic? Because I can see that at least like, I think sixteen percent of the patients already had yes. a just fluoroscopic guidance. So we know that uh, from from the past criteria, we cannot. Uh, we are still very laid back. I mean, we just follow the past criteria, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's very very hard just to assess the stability of the. Uh, watchman device or other devices uh, by just doing fluoroscopy. So I was just wondering what is the pr usual protocol in China, how you can carry that out pre and post procedure and also during the procedure to assess the stability of the device? Yeah, uh, this is a very important question. And before I do this study, I didn't know that we have 16% of patients without any uh, image guided, only uh, fluoroscopy. But after I done this uh, study, I know that uh, uh, interesting that uh, it has uh, no difference be uh, between these uh, two groups and compare with events rates. And, uh, but I have to say that the, the centers uh, with uh, less uh, procedural cases or less experience, they tend to do uh, image guided procedure. But the centers, that do more than 80 uh, cases a year, they tend to do fluoroscopy only strategy. So that I, I feel that maybe um, they, uh, they have already have a, a pre um, a, a procedure the TE uh, examination. So they understand uh, how to, they have a, a plan, a, a planned a procedure. And they feel that in sim simplified cases, they do not need to do any image guided. I just guess, guess. So, but in my center, we, or we do uh, image guided procedure. But uh, anyway, uh, so this fluoroscop uh, uh, fluoroscopy only procedure in these experienced centers do not increase events rate. It's definitely, so it's uh, now in China, some centers, they have increased fluoroscopy uh, uh, percentage. The next expert speaker, Dr. Shandavamol of the Ramati Bodhi Hospital in Thailand, shares his impression and experiences of left atrial appendage occlusion advancement over time, from past to present.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Man Chandabimo from Ramatibidi Hospital, Bangkok, Thailand. Um, I'm talking about impression of left atrial bandage occlusion advancement from past to present. Uh, before I get started, we'd like to thank uh, Hong Kong Society of Congenital and Structural Heart Disease um, and LAO Summit 2012 uh, Organizing Committee to have me here today. Um, I would like to start off with the current guidelines. Um, the most recent one from ESC was 2020, and it recommend that LA occlusion can be considered in patient with AFib with contraindication to long-term anticoagulant. Unfortunately, it's only class 2B. Uh, we all hope that it should be, or hope to be 2A. Uh, nonetheless, it's mainly because um, it is um, the data that we have at the time, um, mostly with registry, um, which was added uh, evolution, Canadian and French registry on top of the PROTECT AF and other trials from the early Watchman studies. Uh, ACCAJ also class uh, 2B as well. Uh, despite that, I think we're still closing a good amount of left atrial appendage, but why we want to close them, I think we know that um, the appendage uh, is the origin of the clot most of the time, 91% on, on this uh, uh, study. And uh, also who really wants to take anticoagulation for the rest of your life or whether you, if you cannot take them, such as high bleeding risk or already had a serious bleeding. I just want to point out that uh, this is one of the trials um, of NOAX, um, a piece of band compared to what I mean can tokenist, a risk total trials found that in the group that had bleeding, you have to realize that if you are bleeding, even though it happened less frequently, but if it happened intraocular bleed while on a piece of band, the risk of death is um, 132 times higher. Um, even higher than when you bleed with warfarin and also increased risk of ischemic and MI as well in the group of bleeding. So if they do bleed, they tend to do very, very poorly. And uh, other major bleeding from other trials um, is also in the four to five, uh, four percent range. So I think the bottom line is if it prevent clots or if systemic uh, treating the clot, it will bleed or increase risk of bleeding. On top of that, the compliance um, of the medication, even though it's easier to take, but we found the study showed that up to 30% of no act patients have to stop drugs after two years. Whereas uh, LA occlusion, which is a one-time intervention, um, will have to start off with the Watchman LA occlusion device that had a CE mark since 2005 and US FDA approved in 2015. And the data from a prevailed and protective trials had a long-term data of five years. Uh, you know that uh, this one showed there's no difference in all stroke or systemic embolization compared to warfarin, but it reduced hemorrhagic stroke, disabling or fatal stroke, and also decrease in cardiovascular or unexplained death and reduced non-procedural uh, major bleeding. And uh, with that, with the FDA approval, there's a uh, accumulative increase uh, volume of lip atrial appendage occlusion in the US. Um, with the uh, registries um, found that uh, implant success rate remains really high, 98.8%, uh, with a very low uh, complication rate in the real world data. I think people are more interested in uh, area occlusion compared to no acts now since it's our main anticoagulation. Uh, this is a PLAC-17 trials published in 2020, compare LA occlusion to either Watchman or uh, amulet device compared to NOAX, found it's non-inferiority um, <clears throat> in both per protocol and on treatment. Uh, another trials using amulet uh, trials from Nielsen Kuntz found that uh, ischemic stroke, major bleeding or mortality composite endpoint uh, was significantly lower in a uh, LA occlusion compared to no X hazard ratio of 0.57. Ischemic stroke is no difference, but reduced in major bleeding, all-cause mortality, and cardiovascular mortality. 
Pam to cost effectiveness, um, also important to know, uh, even though this is done in the States, it found that even though it may be uh, had upfront cost, but over time it will uh, cross with, in, with regarding to clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. When compared to NOAX, it's even better than compared to Warfarin uh, because of cost, time to clinical effectiveness is five years and time to cost effective is at five years as well. How about in Asian population? I think we had uh, some data. This is a WAPS registry that uh, I was involved in as well as um, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital from Hong Kong found that of um, 200 patients, 100 uh, were Asian and the, another half was non-Asian, found that uh, compared to expected uh, ischemic or stroke embolization, if anything, Asian had a more dramatic response compared to non-Asian as well as reduction in bleeding compared to the non-Asian. The advancement, another thing that we uh, uh, important is the sizing and pre-procedural planning, TEE versus CT. We are familiar with all these uh, typical 0, 45, 90, and 135 degree view, but uh, as to on the downside, you know that um, sometimes we do not really get to the biggest uh, diameter of the appendage. And uh, with this, uh, show that when compare CT with the TDEE, usually percent average after sizing is about 12% and even higher up to 20% if compared to 2D TEE. So this is um, come to the expert uh, recommendation on the use of CT in pre-procedure uh, planning of left atrial occlusion. This paper not only um, about sizing, but also um, to uh, evaluate uh, LA clot, uh, transeptal puncture, and also the potential of uh, fusion imaging. Uh, also recommend uh, how to do uh, proper measurements from different devices. Uh, advancement um, on the device itself is also important. I'll focus on the, this three or four devices. Uh, number one is Watchman, which is now uh, have moved to uh, Watchman Flex. And there's certain uh, difference, as you can see, the shape is different in the sense that they have a round distal end, uh, more struts to make it more conform uh, to the appendage, 18 versus 10, more fabric coverage, double row anchors, 18 instead of 10, less metal exposure, shorter height, about half of the device, and had larger device size up to 35. This is how it's deployed on the left-hand side. You can see, uh, make the procedure much more simpler. That's after deployment. Amulet is a Netanol um, wire device, um, had uh, two, two components. Uh, one is the lobe and one of the disc. The anchoring is by compression of the lobe with small hooks. Uh, the uh, delivery system is up to 14 French, allow proximal implantation techniques. Device diameter was up to 34 mm. So this is how it's deployed um, in the chicken wing morphology. Another devices that use uh, quite common in our region is Lambre occluder, uh, also a netinol frame with PET membrane had uh, two uh, component device. One is the umbrella, which used to anchor the appendage by compression, hooks, and larger barbs here. Also a so-called pectinate grabber. The delivery system is smaller, 10 French, and device range is up to 36 mm with the LA cover up to 50 mm. Two kind of devices, uh, regular uh, devices, and the special design, a small umbrella, big disc. Another uh, devices called Lariat is a pericardial axis. Um, You'd uh, have the magnetic tip to uh, uh, to connect the two inside and outside the heart together, and then to use the loop to close the appendage. When to use which device? I think with a very very short appendage, used to be a mullet or ram blade, but now Watchman Flex I think can be used too. Very small LAA, uh, usually amulet and lambre may be easier. Multi lobes, um, the device with the disc may be better. Uh, Trompers in LA, all devices can be used. Bad angle between delivery system and left edge appendage, perhaps Watchman is better. Another um, thing we know about the, devi uh, the device related uh, thrombus is also important. 
the incidence is roughly about um, <clears throat> two to four percent in the, all these trials. Um, it not no relationship between device thrombosis and medication according to evolution, and it happens about four percent. Amulet, in another hand, despite uh, using less oral anticoagulant, majority of the medication was adapted. Found that the device related thrombosis is a little lower, 3.3% compared to first generation Watchman 4.5%. Uh, device related thrombosis, um, the <coughs> multivariate analysis showed that DAPT or oral anticoagulation is better than SAPT. And once there's a device thrombosis or device thrombus on the device, there's four times increased risk of stroke or TIA. So it's not a benign thing. Corrid device leak is another uh, topic of interest. You can see that uh, this leak uh, by theory can cause uh, thrombus formation by um, turbulent flow, enhanced platelet and clot formation. Um, the data come from NCDR LA registry of 50,000 patients um, found that 25.8% uh, had a small 0 to 5 mm leak, which is original acceptable after before deployment found that this may relate it to uh, incidents of thromboembolic or bleeding events in the future. Uh, amulet, in another hand, any leak happened a little less, about 12.5% from the amulet prospective registry. There's also another trials called Swiss Apro, a compared randomized amulet and watchmen, about 100 patients each, found that when you look at a prior device leak by CT, the uh, incident is about the same, about 70%, but uh, the mechanism of leak is more commonly to be intra the device leak in the amulet group, whereas the watchman is a mixed leak, uh, which is intra device leak plus polarite device leak which is also all different from a TEE, uh, which find up to 27.5% compared to 13.7%. So this is a subject of the interest, how should we follow a CT or a TEE? Uh, however, the procedural complication is less in Watchmen, 27 compared to 9% in Amulet, but there's no clinical outcome difference at 45 days. Another data on Pari device leak uh, recently come out. Um, <clears throat> After five years, found that uh, any leak um, had slight increase in stroke or system leak em uh, uh, embolization, uh, the leak at one year. But there was no difference in or cause death. What of interest to me is that even though they have no PDL at the beginning or at the end of the procedure at one year, um, some patient may have leak happens afterwards and that start to be left atrial appendage remodeling. I think this is open a new field of how we're going to follow up these patients. Also, the issue of how to close the appendage depends on the size and the anatomy of it um, as shown here. I just want to conclude that LA advancement over the past to present, I think we have improved in patient selection, which may be different between countries. Device has been improved, pre-procedure planning also important, 3D is important. More evidence, especially compared to no acts and also big registries, cost effectiveness. And I think we need to know more about disease or this device specific complication and how to manage. And hopefully with the new guidelines, with more evidence gathering, we can move up from 2B to 2A. Thank you for your attention. The third expert speaker, Dr. Tang of the Kiang Wu Hospital in Macau, discusses how to tackle challenging anatomy with new generation devices. Thank you. It's my pleasure to meet all my good friends and to share some cases. Um, the uh, case with unusual anatomy. Uh, since the shape of the LAO varies greatly, the selection of the operated occluder pace and important role in the in the entire operation. Uh, the new generation of watchmen, watchmen fast with uh, the features of fill, seal, heel. Uh, can give the inter international interventional cardiologist better in confidence 
in the LAO procedure. After the years of the uh, refillment, uh, refillment, the watchman fast just as simple as putting the end together. This decided with the higher safety, higher uh, protection uh, success rate and, uh, and better clinical result. The, the device had been improvement in many aspects. First, uh, it has increased the form from 10 uh, perimeter struck to 18, thereby increasing the connect between the occluda and the actual appendage. This depth is changed from the ratio of 1 to 1 uh, to 1 to 0 0.5. This in improvement has better effect on some cases with zero LAA. It can cover the LA size of 14 to 51 uh, mini millimeter and improve the production for procedure success rate. The design of the bulb is changed for, uh, from V shape to J shape, which is conducive to the fixation of the occluder. Besides it, besides it decreasing the uh, injury of the LAA caused by the bulb, so as the reduce the preparation per cardio uh, effection. The metal at the junction is also uh, reduced by 70%, which is conducive to the process of endo and endophilization. The ball shift of the watchman first announced the osteum occluder to the to, to be rechecked and released more safely. Oh, sorry, the the PowerPoint some problem. So oh, sorry, I'm so, Okay, I'll try again. Okay. Mm -mm. I share again the, my PowerPoint. Uh, we can see that okay, uh, we can see this with this uh, post post process here. Mark how is the fur uh, as Asia Pacific region to apply the watchman fast. Here I bring 
two uh, interesting cases. The first case, uh, the first case uh, is a 76 years old gentleman with past medical history uh, of hypertension, diabetes, AV with the uh, first degree AVB and, and micro uh, implantation. He was fine large uh, bruises after taking NOS. His trust was score was four and his best score was three. We arranged him to undergo the LAO with the help of TEE we see that the LAA osteum was only 14, 14 millimeter. That means a, a case uh, that could not be done with the older generation of watchmen, but uh, if the but if the if the first the case could be attended under forescopy, uh, under forescopic uh, guidance. We can see that the size of LAA was about the same as the same size as a micro. We send the occluder to the uh, distal end of the LAA. Uh, we draw the shift, and the fastball was seen as it was shaved uh, in this condition. Uh, we released and the uh, the Okuda uh, under for, under forscopic uh, guidance. We saw that the osteum uh, the Okuda system was placed too far, and TEE also confirmed it. So we tried to we uh, we checked it uh, halfway, and then released it again. Therefore, scope and the T D again uh, imaging uh, so good placement. The second case was sixty five sixty five years old gentleman with past medical history of AFib hypertension. Hemorrhagic transfer motion after a cerebral infarction. His transfer score was four, and his base score was four. We arranged that patient to perform LAAO. T showed that uh, this was rash LAA. The diameter of the ostium was about uh, 14, 14 millimeter and the depth was not very deep. The foroscopy image showed that the osteum of the LA was very large. So we, we, uh, so we chose the fit, uh, 55 millimeter occluder. We put the pigtail on the upper loop of the occluder and then slowly released it Before releasing, we see that the lower edge was not uh, highly at attached. And a three millimeter gra uh, gap could be seen to the TEE. We put back the occluder and fit it Switched, and it was uh, expected that to uh, that the lower artery uh, would fall after the release. So uh, we finally dis dis decided to release, and the result was same as our con conceived con 
sense consideration after the release the fluoroscopic image so that the ostium was was uh, occluder was com com uh, completely closed. Uh, this are uh, the case that I bring to you. I think that the this new generation of the device uh, will have better applications in the future. Thank you. The following expert speaker, Dr. Fong of the Princess Margaret Hospital in Hong Kong, details the ICE guided LAAO procedure with helpful tips and tricks. Now, uh, as what previous speaker said, we know that there are a lot of improvement in the design of the Watchman uh, LA occluder. Now, uh, we know, know that the newer generation Watchman Flex is more user friendly and it's got a better efficacy and more safety uh, for the procedure. Now, you wonder why we want to use eyes? I think uh, the previous speaker I already point out that there are many advantages of using eyes. But for me personally, I actually I got the, a personal reason because in my lab, I, it's very difficult for me to arrange uh, the anesthetist. So uh, I, sometimes I have difficulty to organize the GA session. And especially during the COVID period, I know that uh, a lot of hospitals, uh, including mine, hospital, uh, the are uh, GA is forbidden in the cath lab, so I have to explore some other way to do my LA occluder. Now, um, so there are several advantages of using eyes. Uh, we, of course, uh, we can uh, do it under local anesthetic and reduce the risk of using the general anesthetic and reduce the risk of respiratory infection. And I personally find that even uh, in terms of the time, procedure time, uh, the total procedure time is actually shorter because usually uh, when the NS is preparing for the case, it takes a lot of time. But for me, I, I'm so used to just doing all the PCI procedure. That's why just simply ice guide is actually more, uh, more easy for me. And also I don't have to work with another uh, the people, I mean, to do the echo, you know, sometimes have communication problem because you want that feel and then it's difficult for me to tell them how to switch. But if I'm using eyes, I can just manipulate the eyes guide myself. So it's uh, actually easier for me. But of course, uh, we know that there are ch several challenges of using eyes to do the procedure. Uh, one is the sizing. Um, we don't uh, compare for TAE for eyes. It's more difficult to get the correct sizing. And, and, and get the, all the angles. I remember that um, uh, Gary actually asked about how we can get all the four angle, uh, angle to do the uh, pass criteria before we release the procedure. But that's a challenge, you use the eye to do the same thing, okay? Uh, and also the technique-wise is more challenging to manipulate the eyes inside a small heart. Now, that's why uh, I've to make the procedure smoothly, I actually use some more other uh, device to help me, especially the CT scan. I find the CT scan is very, very helpful to use it uh, together with eyes. Now, uh, my personal post protocol is to use a CT scan together with pre tde and eyes and a fluoroscopy, all four of them together to make the procedure uh, uh, easier. Now, um, for pre-CT scan, previous speaker already said that uh, the CT scan measurement is sometimes can give you a more uh, correct measurement compared with the TAE. And it, you know that for the TAE, you can only obtain several angles and you might miss the largest uh, diameter of the ostium. Whereas for T CT scan, you can get the 3D and different cutting angle and get the optimal measurement for the ostium. And also the same CT image can actually incorporate in the fluoroscopy machine. And this kind of CT uh, fluoroscopy hybrid image is very, very helpful for, for us to do the procedure. First of all, it allows to see the pulmonary vein, the, even the LAA, and also the septum all at the same time. And we can use this to guide the transital puncture to choose the, post, the site of the puncture and the angle of the puncture. 
and reduce the needs of uh, TEE, of course, to contrast injection. And we all know that uh, the traditional way to do the LA is to do a pre-TEE, but I also do the TEE myself because I'm not too familiar with the CT. I'm not sure whether I can use the CT to replace TEE. So for me, I usually would do a pre-TEE to exclude any from birth and also do four angle measurement myself. And then after that, during the procedure time, I will use the CT and just get a hybrid CT image like this one. You can see that uh, all the chamber is shown clearly on the fluoroscopy. And when you turn the intensifier, the CT image just moves together with the intensifier. So you can just choose whatever angle you want and to choose the best angle you want to deploy your LA device. And also, one important thing is actually you can pre before procedure, choose the best site you want to do the puncture. So you mark it with a, I, I will mark it with a yellow circle, like, like in, the, in, the, in the image. I don't know how to do this. And then I could just puncture with that uh, marking as my reference. And then you can see that from this picture, you, I can puncture just between the LA and left, uh, upper pony vein. So it's easier for me to see where I should go. But without that, it's very difficult for me to guess where is the pony vein, where is the LAA. Okay, now that's, I use the eyes to test the puncture and just contrast to confirm the position. And then um, because um, during procedure for eyes, I can't obtain too many uh, angles for the measurement. So I usually would do a fluoroscopy uh, LAA gram to do my measurement, just like when you do the amulet. Okay, now, uh, okay. now I can do the measurement here. Just approximate this is uh, 24.9 millimeter. And after that, I try to use my eyes to get a TE mimic angle, okay? Actually, we can do that, okay? Well, if you put the eyes in the left upper point of vein, it's approximately about 40, TE 40, 45 degree. And then when you just pull back the eyes and then get a relatively vertical angle, we can get a 90 degree, degree angle. And again, you can just kind of rotate the, you know, the eyes and get a, a mid LA view and it approximates the zero degree angle of the TEE. And lastly, you can just also rotate the eyes to go to the mitral analyst or mitral info and to obtain your 135 degree angle. Now, um, for the deployment, I would recommend you to do the, uh, use the left upper pulmonary vein view because when you put the eyes on in the upper pulmonary vein, it's more stable and it's uh, better for use. And you can see the, uh, the circumflex, like in, in the image here. Uh, so it's easier for you to use the working view to do your deployment. Okay, so uh, this is how I do the deployment using both imaging tool. And after that, I will check for the pass criteria, position, anchor, size, and seal. So I pull, uh, first of all, I just check it from the 45 degree, which is like a left upper pulmonary vein, and do the measurement, okay? You can check the compression with the eyes and also the depth. And after that, you can do the colors, look for leakage, okay? And you, if you're happy, then you can go to the 90 degree. Okay, just pull down the eyes, okay? And try to retroflex and anticlockwise a bit more, and then you can get the vertical angle and approximate to the 90 degree of TEE. Now you could do the same, uh, measurement of compression and depth, and also the for check for uh, color Doppler for leakage. And then you can actually more, you know, uh, actually rotate the, the eyes a bit clockwise and then retroflex and put it like a, rather a, a mid LA view, which is approximately the zero degree of the TEE. So do the same thing. And lastly, just further anticlockwise and go to the mitral inflow and do the 135 degree measurement. Okay, and after that, I will do the tuck test uh, just at the 135 degree. Okay, if you look stable, then I'm happy and release the device. Um, and then the rest is the uh, same procedure. And then the, and after that, I'll discharge the patient the second day and do the follow-ups TEE. So conclusion, 
I think CT scan does give a lot of useful information for uh, procedural planning as well as uh, for uh, procedural guidance. iSCAD approach is feasible method, especially when you have a limited GA session, you should consider it. And then I actually, it is safe not to use TE, um, especially if you have a CT scan uh, together with the ice guided uh, approach. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fong. So, maybe I start with a question uh, first. Is there any scenario that from the original CT you find there is a possibility of high risk of in atypical features that uh, will, will make it a challenging case to start with? then we tr you will decide straight away that this is a TEE case, that you will go for TEE instead of asking a patient to pay extra for the eyes. So the second question is, I think the direction for aerial closure is towards the eyes. But for me, for example, I'm still in the comfort zone of doing TEE because it, I learned that way, um, GA sex facilities and, and this is just sort of readily available in our facilities. But uh, it, it appears that there's some difficulties because even the company, they don't revise their own uh, instruction for use for use in the TE, uh, for eyes for the direct, uh, for the for the procedure. And what you show us is very step by step and it's very clear cut the protocol that we can adopt. So what do you think about the obstacles uh, in adopt, mean making it a really a replacement for TE in a short period, within a short period of time? Well, I, I think it's just... Um to me personally, I think uh, after adopting the eyes approach, actually I feel more comfortable. I'll tell you one scenario. I, I have arranged an elderly lady just to come in because of uh, bleeding with the anticoagulation. So I just arranged her to have a GA, you know, uh, TE guide. And, uh, and it's a just physical refuse. Okay, refuse. And then I've arranged everything. So I just asked them, maybe you, you, want to, you want to try the eyes, just give her you know, more, more money. And, if, and she's happy. And it's actually quite easy for me, especially if uh, some inpatient consult you. You know, that sometimes it's just difficult for you to get an extra uh, GA session just for the inpatient. So it's more easy for me just to add on one extra session. It's just maybe a bit longer than PCI. But I think it's actually, if you get used to it, it's actually much quicker than the GA session. Um, maybe maybe one one and a half hour will be will be okay, um, but it takes some time to you know get used to the step all the, all the steps. Uh, I think for you it's okay. It's, you know you're just quite used to the the eye. It's it's just um, because we we train by the TAE that we so rely on that. That I mean it's a psychological barrier rather than a real barrier. Um, and also I think the transeptal puncture is also is the key. Um, I think. To be honest, my, my, I, I don't like to use the same hole because there's a lot of interaction between the two guys. I like to do separate puncture. I think separate puncture is better, but it takes a little bit more time. But you, you are easier for you to manipulate the eyes. Yeah, that, that's, that's my secret, well, secret, yeah, advice. So any, any patient you think, we, this is not eyes, is the image got to be poor and we need more guidance and with 3D, for example, then you would go straight for TE. Um. Well, well, um, for, for, I think I think I think only only those patients who really scared of LA. Some uh, I have one patient uh, just asking me to GA because she, she doesn't like to know about the procedure, and also the pri I mean the cost. I think uh, they want to, don't want to pay the extra money, but I think for private medical cost not be about the same. I think is it? I'm not sure, but but for private pri uh, public definitely it's cheaper to use a GA section. But we think about the cost of GA, the anesthetist and the echocardiographer may not be really cheaper. Yeah, the exact cost, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon. Yeah, I, I followed your comment. Uh, I would like to share the, the overview of my comment mm -hmm. and opinion in the ice guide area. Uh, you raised a really good point that uh, a different center uh, in different uh, hospital, no matter in overseas in Hong Kong, and also the difference in the uh, actual uh, hospital, hospital, authority uh, hospital, and also private sector. Different center have different protocol, and also mm. different uh, operator have their own experience. So no, I think I think uh, in conclusion, we should not uh, ask a particular uh, operator to 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 have a certain um, uh, the requirement or either TE or ice guide. Just uh, do uh, consider uh, which. Uh, uh, way to guide the procedure mm -hmm. is uh, at your most convenience yes. and also uh, comfortable um, uh, based your, your team experience. 
uh, for the sake of the patients. Well, that's so, a fair, fair comment. It's just like any other intervention procedure. There's no gold standard. I mean, you, you must use this way rather than other. I mean, whether you're comfortable, safe, I mean, safety is the most important thing. I think safety, especially for this procedure, because you know that this is not for treatment. You know that's prevention. You, safety is most important, I think, for this procedure. That's why you need to do something you're comfortable with. Yeah. yeah, just don't force yourself to, yeah. I think. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And the last expert speaker, Dr. Chan of the Hong Kong Sanatorium and Hospital, expands on the process of streamlining implantation with specific pre procedural insights. So this is a uh, Saturday evening, so I hope I will not delay uh, too much for your, for your dinner. So this is the last talk and uh, relaxing talks. Okay, just think about any insight about the streamlining implantation with the procedural images. So in the old days, we know that if we do LAO, we need pre-op uh, imaging usually, okay? Uh, in the old days, we uh, relied on TEE, usually the 2D images. And later on, we did the 3D and give you a more accurate measurement and the shape of the LAA. And then later on, we did a CT scan and, uh, and use uh, different software to have help us to have a detailed analysis. And even up to now, we have stimulations, okay, like the VOPS, okay, and in order to give you the best uh, a choice of a size and also the position of the device. So let me go uh, into each of them one by one. So this is, I, I know you are all familiar with uh, these images. This is the TE images. Before you do TE, you must familiar with all these echo images, the 2D and even 3D. And, uh, and after that, so we have the CT. And uh, in, personally, I use CT a lot. And I, I use uh, different software to uh, help me to analyze it. Uh, for the CT, the software, OK, actually, it helps me a lot, especially if you want to use iceguided.lao, uh, because it will give you an idea of the shape of the LAA, the orientation. And also, they have uh, fluoroscopic simulations uh, to guide you during the procedure as you can see here. And also for the sizing, uh, I, to my experience, it is more accurate than uh, uh, the other measurements. So this is one of the example. Oh. And also the, the software will give you uh, other P procedure panning, okay, it's like the transeptal puncture. And uh, usually in the old days, uh, we will we are talk, okay, to you to do the transeptal puncture inferior and posteriorly. Most of the case, yes, but some in some case you can you can just puncture at the central position is good enough. Okay, so by using the software, it will give you an idea where will be the best puncture site for you to have a best uh, approach to the LAA tips. Also, there is another software uh, from another company. I think uh, some of you had used that. Okay, it, is, uh, it seems uh, easier to use. The same as Freeman Zero, uh, which has uh, analysis of the size of the LAA. But one of the feature I like it most is it also has simulation on the eyes, as you can see here. So with the CT data, so we have, by using this software, you can have uh, eyes echo simulation so you can uh, see that oh sorry okay so you can simulate in this program moving in and out in the la rotated and also turn anterior and posterior so you can see in the middle so you use your handle and on your right hand side you will see the simulated ice images so you can imagine uh, at that the, during the procedure if you use eyes guided so you can know okay what will be the size and the shape of the LAA. And even up to now, okay, we have the simulation software. So this is one of the uh, trial presented by uh, Dr. Becker in TCT this year. It's a PDIC LAA trial. Okay, is uh, trying to see whether the simulation software it helps to improve the outcome of LAO. 
So the background is because in the old days, we've used our usual methods, there's still some people uh, suffering, uh, suffering from PoE device leak and also device-related fumbles, and we all know that it will affect the long-term outcome. So this is uh, one of the uh, trials to use a simulation software. This is a prospective multi-center randomized trial with 200 patients divided into two groups. One group is just standard use of planning by CT, and another group is using CT and also the cardiac computers, uh, is the simulation basis planning. And the device they use is the, uh, yeah, the AMLED device. So this is the full chart of the study design. So you can see the 200 patients randomized into two groups equally. And the outcome okay, will, have, will be assessed by the three months uh, cardiac CT. So this is a useful CT analysis. I think all of you have used it before. And uh, this is um, the simulation program. So I will show you two cases later on. So the study endpoint of this uh, study is uh, quite interesting. So they have looked at the primary endpoint to see whether there will be incomplete LAA closure with residual construct leakage into the LAA uh, and presence of any devices related fumbles. And also the secondary endpoint to see the efficacy and the safety of a procedure, um, how, how well we can obtain a complete LAA closure, and uh, also avoiding the deeds of the amulet to retract into the LAA, and also some clinical endpoints. So just give you the, the idea of the baseline characteristics. So uh, for the baseline characteristic, it's almost the same, and you can see that uh, highlight in the yellow box, so the TE ima imaging and also the ice guided imaging is almost uh, half okay, in the study. And this is the clinical endpoint by CT, so there are different grading of the leak. And for the cardiac CT outcome, so you can see here, so for the complete, so you can see the yellow box, so if you're talking about the leakage in grade 3 to 4, and or uh, with or without the device related fumbles. So if the pay, uh, people or the patient underwent the cardiac simulation planning, so is it lower uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, this uh, high graded leakage? Although this is not significant, the p value is 0 0.08, but it's so decreased. And uh, also the secondary endpoint, if you're talking about the complete LAA closure, it did significantly decrease in the uh, patient who used the CT simulation uh, program. And also significant decrease in rejection of the disc into the LA and also uh, a lower in device relief fumbles, although it is not significant. How about the uh, procedure efficacy and safety? So you can see that um, using of two or more closure devices is significantly lower in the CT simulation group repositioning the same, and the procedure time and the radiation time is lower in the CT simulation planning group, and other are not significant. The clinical endpoint, it, uh, all of them were not significant. However, the study has no power to study the difference in clinical endpoint. So at this moment, we do not know okay, whether using this kind of simulation program has an effect on clinical outcome, but I believe it ha has effect uh, so in the future, we may need further study to confirm the difference. So in summary, so using the CT simulation program, so uh, it seems to use less device, less uh, repositioning, and uh, you can achieve a, a, a complete LA closure in single attempt. So I will show you two cases. So the first case uh, is, um, it was a 74 years old lady, so indication for LAO because of upper GI breathing. So we plan to do the LAO with uh, watch, uh, Watchman Fax device. Okay, we use the CT uh, as usual with the Femenzio. We obtain the measurement of around 30 millimeter. So this is the measurement by the Femenzio. And then we uh, use the free ops as well for the simulation, sorry for the quality of the, the, the uh, video. But uh, by using the free ops, so you can see the whole LAA, the whole LA, the orientation, you can change it. And in different orientation, 
corresponding to your fluoroscopic image. And uh, so they will try to simulate with the different size of the device. So in, uh, this is an old case in back to 2020. So at that time, the simulation program can, uh, can only give you the watchman device. So they use the watchman device, uh, 33 meter, millimeter uh, device. So even by the CT software, we, we decide to use 33 if uh, we go for watchman. So they will put it Okay, simulated in a uh, distal position and also the proximal position as you can see here. And you can see also the red uh, uh, color uh, around the device. Is, uh, it represents the leakage okay, uh, along or uh, aside the device. So more red in color, so that means the leak uh, it will be more. So you can see that here, if we put a 33 millimeter device more distally, so maybe in one aspect more helium, the silicon flag artery, so it will have a more leakage. But if you put it uh, more proximally, so we will have less leakage. So this is another angle showing the LAA orientation. So in the real case, so we try to uh, uh, put the device uh, in the proximal position, but at that time, because Watchman Fax is, uh, was available in Hong Kong, so we changed to use the Watchman Fax. We used the 35 millimeter device and uh, with the same panning to try to put it at the proximal position, as you can see here. So I think the position is great. Okay, we did it in single attempt and without any leakage. And uh, we did a six month uh, follow up CT. Okay, so in, in my center, we did uh, all the patient with LAO uh, with a follow up CT. We didn't do the uh, TE anymore. So the CT showed complete ceiling with no leakage and no fumbus. The fluoroscopic time was around 20 minutes. And the second case, uh, the same with a high risk of reading. Uh, the gentleman went for LAO with amulet. So by using the VOPS, it also show you, okay, we'll measure the uh, ostium, the landing zone as usual, and show you the, the corresponding size. So in this case, the corresponding size should be 28 millimeter amulet device. So they will try to give you the simulation results. So for example, using a 25 millimeter device, proximally and distally, if you put it uh, using a 28 proximally, so how l much leakage you will get in this totally, how, uh, how is the difference? And also you can appreciate the Ds, okay? If you use the amulets, okay, you, sometimes you need to pay attention to the Ds orientation. You don't want it to be retracted into the LAA. So the simulation can give you the, the expected outcome and for you to choose. So in this case, we we'll try to choose the 28 millimeter uh, device and put it proximally. And uh, so this is the images during the procedure, okay, with the same angle as the simulation. And we try to put it exactly, okay, the same uh, location the simulation program suggested. And this is the end uh, the, um, before the end LAA gram before the release. And by echo, it seems uh, uh, perfect. So this, uh, this is the position we want. And there was leaky at all, no leaky at all. So the fluoroscopic time, well, it was around 12 minutes. So I think the simulation uh, software has its uh, uh, um, uh, significance uh, in uh, the future, uh, which can help us to plan our procedure in more detail and hope to shorten our procedure time and increase the safety, especially if we want to do the ICE procedure. And also, okay, except uh, for the CT levigator, we also can have uh, using the echo levigator. So this is one of our case to use the echo levigator. So we, it helps you to paste the, uh, put in the LAO device, although you can do it without the echo levigator. But another interesting uh, 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 point to use it is uh, you can, uh, try to uh, move your fluoroscopy to to the angle that uh, uh, the the echo levigator you will see the landing zone will be parallel to your device. So at that angle, so you will get the most optimal uh, angle to assess your protrusion of the device. 
so I think it will help you to uh, get a better result and in order to decrease the future uh, complication or adverse event. So to conclude, the procedural imaging and planning is important, especially if you want to use the ICE-guided uh, uh, procedure. It will help you to uh, have a less uh, procedure time, less risk of uh, complication, and more optimal result. And hopefully in the future, it can translate into uh, a better clinical outcome. I think simulation is especially useful in case uh, of challenging anatomy or borderline size of the LAA. Okay, for example, in the case of uh, Dr. Tam had in Macau, so if you encounter a very large uh, LAA uh, landing zone, so sometimes the simulation may give you whether you should do it or not, or you should try, uh, try to use the other uh, device. And also, if the, you encounter the patient who has the distal loop fumbus, so maybe you can have uh, this uh, pre-op planning, and uh, hopefully you can do it in single attempt. So acknowledgement to uh, this company. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason, for the excellent talk on the pre-procedure insight. So let me take the privilege to ask you uh, two questions. So uh, you, you very well illustrated that there is very sophisticated uh, imaging and pre-procedure planning modality. So, uh, but from the data you've shown us that it seems that uh, this simulation does not affect the uh, device size resizing or recapture. So how do you think um, this simulation pro process is going to affect your implantation uh, procedure or the decision itself? Is it the transeptal puncture, depth of implant, etc.? So the second question is, uh, from this symposium, we see that uh, there is a very simple implantation strategy like in, the, in, in China, there's more than 15% of using fluoroscopy, whereas uh, in, in your presentation, there's also very sophisticated pre-procedure planning. So do you think, uh, what was your insight on the future of LAA closure in standard procedures? Uh, does these uh, sophisticated simulations only apply for challenging anatomy or is going to be the, uh, for all standard anatomy? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ken. Uh, so if you're talking about whether the simulation program will affect my uh, uh, choice of sizing, so it will not, okay, actually. Uh, but it may affect my, uh, uh, my pending zone okay, to deploy the device. So sometimes uh, you will try to deploy, uh, deploy more distally or uh, more proximally. So with this simulation program, so I think it can give you an idea whether you should paste the device, where should you paste the device, and uh, try to decrease uh, the number of re uh, deployment. So you know that if we deploy more, so it may increase the chance of a uh, complication. So I think this is the, the, the usefulness of this simulation program. And uh, if you're talking about the future, I think the simulation uh, program has its uh, value. So if you're more familiar of the anatomy, the size of the LAA, uh, you can see in China, so some of our colleagues, they do it uh, under only fluoroscopic uh, guidance. So I don't object it, okay? But I think if you have a very detailed PO planning uh, with experience, I think you can do it safely and uh, perfectly with uh, just fluoroscopic guidance. Um, so there's some... I've, I've also been um, studying these kinds of pre-op pre assessment for the um, imaging, I mean, CT-guided uh, planning. But uh, there's something that I cannot really get myself is the, when you actually put the device, you cannot, there's, uh, because when I was in training, the LA has different elasticity. The problem with this planning is that you cannot expect, I, I mean, you cannot really uh, plan how much compression there will be from the device because the LA is different in different area, the landing zone or more deeper into the LA. So if there's the elasticity in different LA in different patients are different, how do you see the compression that's going to be very accurate in real life because you cannot really see the real compression because of the elasticity. So what's your experience in um, what, how accurate it is in predicting this kind of uh, compression because compression is uh, uh, more very is, is very important in uh, in using when assessing the price criteria. So, 
because the LA is very elastic and very thin, uh, when you put in a device, if it's not elastic, then, then I mean, then it can be compressing differently. So, what's your experience uh, in, in in these kinds of planning? Whether it's really accurate in in, in predicting the compression after you use the de uh, device? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deng Li. Uh, so, this is a very good question. So. Uh, to my experience, okay, if you just use CT, yes, yeah, sometimes uh, it's different okay, from your real life. So that's why the people try to do the simulation. So because they get all the data in the past and try to uh, do, uh, put it into the simulation program. So try to, uh, they, they will get all the results in the previous center. So different anatomy, different sizing. So uh, what device, so how they will behave under that scenario. So I, of course, I cannot say it will be perfect, but at least this is a huge data, uh, so give you a more predictable outcome. Okay, but uh, in the real life, whether it can translate into clinical uh, uh, effect or um, better clinical outcomes, we still need further study. But uh, in terms of procedural uh, uh, outcome, I think it did a good job. Thank you, Jason, for your excellent talk. My, my first part of my question is very close to Danny's question. You know, in the past, we have so many cases with patients who have fake, fake trapeculation inside the LAA, makes the procedure extremely difficult, especially sizing. How about, how about your, what's your, uh, what's your opinion or experience with this simulation software in those patients with extremely thick trapeculation inside the LAA? And also, do you have any, 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 any patient characteristic that you find that stimulation software is not that useful? Um, thank you, Dr. Cherry. Uh, although I use the stimulation program, but I'm not an expert in it yet. Okay, I, I didn't use it very, uh, uh, very, I, I mean, in terms of lumbar, I, I didn't use it a lot yet. So, but uh, in my limited experience, I think it is, it is useful. And uh, even for P, uh, patient with uh, um, heavy trichipulations, so they will try to simulate uh, what will be the behavior of the device if you put in different position. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about which patients should be used, which patients should not, uh, I don't know yet. This concludes the 2022 LAAO Summit in collaboration with ESC, with special closing remarks from the esteemed president of the ESC, Professor Diller, and the esteemed president of the HK Cash, Dr. Chang. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed this great uh, session, and it obviously shows the, the merits of uh, having this um, joint uh, um, sessions from Europe and East Asia and to learn from each other and to share experience. So um, I guess as Professor Ferrari has had to go, uh, it's uh, also, a, um, I guess I speak in his name. I want to thank you on behalf of DSC for um, um, collaborating uh, with us on, on this. I certainly learned a lot and uh, get got a lot of insights into the importance of, of planning, intracardiac imaging, the, the, the whole advances that are happening in this field. So definitely a very exciting uh, area. And uh, please do not um, uh, forget what Professor Ferrari was offering the, the, the um, idea with this uh, European hydrogen supplement. So if you might be interested. So again, uh, thank you on behalf of DSC and, um, and um, uh, looking forward to future, future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thira. So I, um, in conclusion, so uh, I think all of us of you will uh, agree with me that we learned a lot in this uh, LAO Summit 2022, uh, covering a lot of different topics of LAO, from the ice-guided LAOs, uh, streamlined uh, uh, procedure insights, uh, different anatomy in the, in the new LAO device and also the overview of LAO and also clinical uh, outcome in the uh, mainland China studies. So um, uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to say thank you to um, Boston Scientific. 
Uh, without their support, uh, I think we cannot have this uh, wonderful L summit. So, uh, of course, I need to say thank you to uh, ESC. Uh, without their endorsement and also help, then we cannot find the, those experts uh, from Europe, the night Professor Duna and also Professor Henderson with, the, with his great talk. Of course, I would also like to say thank you to all uh, five um, speakers for their wonderful talks covering different topics. And also, of course, I need to say thank you to all of you, all the audience, either physically in a meeting, also on also online. Without your support, then uh, we cannot do it very uh, fluently. So, um, uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you all of us. So, uh, stay healthy and have a nice weekend. Healthcare professionals are welcome to email your questions to p2pmd.net at gmail.com. That's p2pmd.net at gmail.com. The presenters will provide feedback by email. Please provide your name and any affiliated hospitals and to whom your questions are addressed. Mm -hmm.